Thanks, guys. Good job, good job, good job. So, uh, Congressman Patrick McHenry chairs the powerful House uh, Services, Financial Services Committee. Uh, he's the guy that really drove through the Fit 21 bill um, uh, last week, you know, this, this fairly dramatic development. And uh, we're going to be able to talk to him. He's not quite yet ready with us. Uh, he's doing a few things in Washington, but he's going to be joining us remotely. Uh, but before then, I'm just going to bring out Nick Day, who you've met before, and he's the Managing Editor for Global Policy and, and Regulation. And Nick and I are just going to talk a little bit about this rather dramatic shift that we've seen in the past uh, week or so and, and what its significance could be. So. Uh, bear with us. We're going to get the congressman soon, but look, I think we have something to talk about. Nick, do you want to come out and have a chit chat? So, what do you, I mean? Did you have it on your bingo card? No, honestly, <laughs> going back three weeks ago, sure people were talking about this, but. You know, it didn't really look like there was too much momentum. It's just, oh yeah, maybe we'll talk about this, but here we are. Right, and it's not just that, the Fit 21, right? The, yeah. the, the ETF approval, we had the, over, the, the, the Senate approving the repeal yeah. of the SEC rules on custody. Like, what's going on? Like, what, why the, what do you think is the driver? I know that, you know, what, what, there's a lot, of, a lot of debate over this, but what's shifted things in Washington? Yeah, that's been something I've been thinking about for the last, several sleepless nights. Um, I think it's a couple different things. So the one thing that really strikes me, and this is something I do want to ask Congressman McHenry about, the vote on the SAB 121 repeal, the vote on the Fit 21 bill, those are actually the first times we've seen these crypto specific pieces of legislation come up before the House and Senate. And so to some extent, I'm wondering, is it just that we have never gotten a vote before? Because Sure, it was an overwhelming bipartisan majority on FIT21. It was a bipartisan majority, less overwhelming, but still a majority on the SCB 121 repeal. Right. Um, is it that sentiment has shifted? Is it that it's well, the well, first let's, time we're let's think a little bit about the mechanics of how things get yeah. from committee to the floor, right? You've right. got, that's why you have whips like Tony, em, uh, like Tom Emmett, yeah. you know, pulling the, the caucus together, right? So there's right. obviously work that was going on behind yeah. the scenes. Something happened to accelerate that, right? Yeah. A FIT21, for example, uh, that was first introduced over a year and a half ago. That's something that, you know, they voted out of committee, out of the House Financial Services and Agriculture Committees uh, last summer. And, you know, it looked well on its way to a floor vote in the House last fall before things went a little crazy. And all momentum ground to a halt after October. But, yeah, it just came back up. Clearly, there has been work going on behind the scenes. The lawmakers working on this who include, you know, for example, Congressman French Hill, uh, Congressman Dusty Johnson, they said in you know, press calls and public statements that they had worked with the regulatory agencies. So the CFTC, the SEC, they solicited feedback, they incorporated feedback before getting to what they you know, finally passed uh, last week. So clearly a lot of work behind the scenes, clearly a lot of work with the actual regulators who are going to be directly affected by the passage of this legislation. And so long time coming, absolutely. 71 Democrats signed that, that bill. I think that was probably one of the most startling aspects of that, 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 that it truly yeah. looked like a much more bipartisan process. You know, I know that there's varying opinions on what got them over the line. Um, you know, was this fear of Trump? Is it something else? What's going on? I mean, Trump, that, Trump, the, the co coincidence with Trump's uh, support for crypto is significant. The, the timing is absolutely incredible, right? Because a few weeks ago, former President Trump comes out on stage at Mar-a-Lago at a crypto event. This was for holders of, an, of his NFTs. Uh, says he wants to do more crypto-friendly stuff. And since then, he's clearly been trying to appeal to crypto voters. Uh, you know, his promise to uh, free Ross Ulbricht if he's reelected. Um, something that he pointedly did not do his first term in office. Mm -hmm. uh, the various campaign, you know, taking crypto donations. So the timing absolutely suggests that Democrats who, you know, there are some on the House Democrat uh, caucus who have been saying for a while, we can't cede this issue to Republicans only. Uh, Representative Wiley Nickel, for example. And so I think to some extent, yeah, that absolutely does seem and feel like it might have sparked kind of a greater recognition amongst the Democratic Party that, yeah, this is an issue that people will talk and care about and people are clearly putting money and time and effort into. And 
we are now, what, six months from the election? And but there's about. another constituent, and I think it probably played out in the Senate with that vote, right? And that's good old Wall Street and the power of that money, who they weren't happy about the SEC's custody rules, right? Yeah, so that ties into the SCP-121. And the really interesting vote to me on that one, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, uh, Democrat out of New York, uh, he has a lot of Wall Street as you know, his constituents, and he voted for the repeal in the Senate. And you know, clearly this is an issue uh, that we've heard a lot about. In particular, the approval of the Bitcoin ETFs earlier this year um, you know, created a new market for this custody of Bitcoin as a product, as a service. And major financial institutions have, by and large, not been able to or not been willing to uh, get involved in it because of the SCB 121 rules and regulations and guidance, because it's too expensive for them, or they think it would be too expensive and therefore not worth the cost. And so, um, yeah, I think there is something to that where you have this vote to repeal the guidance from the SEC that is something that banks would want to be repealed because it would make it easier for them to get into this crypto custody service that right now, you know, really Coinbase, I think, is the, by and far, the one and only player. I mean, sure, you have, you know, one or two ETFs that are custody or the assets are custodied by a different company, but Coinbase is the big winner for all of those products or most of those products. Yeah, it was, it was interesting in a way. It was a law, a regulation that uh, really probably didn't matter to the banks until the ETFs came along. Right. And all of a sudden, weirdly, they'd created something that was favoring a crypto company and not a bank. So yeah. the banks had to hold uh, basically a dollar's worth of you know, dollar capital against any right. digital asset, right? Right, yeah, it's just too expensive or- Too expensive to yeah, hold, yeah. It's too expensive. So yeah, the, yeah, before January, not a big deal. You know, there's not much of a market there. And then- uh, So it all gets back in a way to the sort of the, 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 the fervor for Bitcoin or for just holding these assets that led to, you know, the most successful ETF launch in history uh, becoming right. this, this big story. It's fascinating. I think it, it underscores in an, in an, both a direct and an indirect way the power of money in, in Washington. Yeah. Is, it, is, it, is, it, is it greasing, you know, is it the question of greasing the pockets of, you know, the campaign financing yeah. that we all know well and good is a reality? Or just simply that economic clout is actually right. starting to accrue to this industry, whether it is native crypto operators or now these banks and these you know, Wall Street institutions like, like BlackRock that are actually sitting yeah. on the funds. Right, yeah. It's, even if they're not deliberately trying to you know, lobby or whatever, at the, it's still a business. You know, all these banks are businesses that want to you know, make money off of uh, the crypto companies here. And uh, this is one way for them to try and get it to happen. So, absolutely. what does it go from here? Like, what are, what are we still waiting? We haven't got a stable coin bill. Has yeah. still got to get to the floor, right? And what's what, right. what's the, what's the outlook for that? Well, so right now, and again, this is something I want to ask Congressman Henry because I haven't seen any progress on a stable coin bill for a while. We heard a few weeks ago that you know there were discussions between uh, Congressman Henry and various other leaders on this issue uh, with Senate. Uh, members who maybe we could see if this was attached to the FAA reauthorization bill. That did not happen. And at this point, you know, we're a couple weeks out from the election where, and the summer recess where Congress is going to functionally pack up shop and put on a BRB sign and leave town to try and get reelected or, you know, save their seats or whatever. And so I, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of time right now before the elections for anything to happen. The next question is, will anything happen between November when the election happens and January when the new Congress is sworn in? And that might be the window of opportunity where... Well, it's so weird because, like, remember, one of the reasons we were saying nothing was going to happen this year was because it's an election year. Now we're saying stuff is going to happen this year because it's an election year. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, it's become the, the, the pressure point in this whole thing. Um, yeah. wh what's the sticking point, though, around stable coins? Like, I mean, what, what, are, what are the core uh, challenges that are sort of still being debated and fought over? Yeah, so... Um, there seem to be kind of a number of issues where, you know, in particular, uh, Democrats working on this and Republicans working on this have some differences of opinion, ranging from the role of state regulators in overseeing stablecoin issuers to the, you know, specific custody rules to protections and, you know, consumer roles. So there's a couple different issues that seem to be getting worked on. We haven't seen, I think, any recent versions of the legislation, so it's hard to say, you know, what's changed between now and last year and what's gonna change next. But 
you know, those seem to be some of the high level issues that they're still working out before we might see any legislation move forward. And of course, we're still just really talking about stuff that's been happening in the House, and putting aside the, what's it called, the SAB 121, the, 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 the repeal of that SEC law that was bipartisan enough to just squeak through the Senate. But Fit 21 and these other, uh, and the stable coins, if it gets through, and of course, Tom Emma had his own, you know, anti CBDC bill. Right. Like, what chances do those have of getting through the Senate? So this is again where stable coins might still be the main issue because it does seem like there is interest in both chambers, both the House and the Senate to make something happen. The SAB 121 repeal passed through the Senate, but you know, President Joe Biden yeah, already promised a veto and you know, that maybe gave wouldn't some of the be, Democrats. Wouldn't that be like political suicide now when he's got like his own you know, the, well, maybe. The leader, I mean, the leader of the Senate, you know, is, is actually voting in favor of it. And, you know. Well, it depends, because it may be that him promising a veto gave Senate Democrats cover to vote for it, uh, which okay. is one theory I've heard from, you know, people kind of paying attention to this. So uh, I think it's still going to get vetoed. And hello, we Looks have like Congressman we have, Henry. Uh, the Congressman. Congressman Congress Henry, uh, I'll, I'll let you guys go. You're in Nick's good hands. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, and please welcome Congressman McHenry. Over to you. It's very good to see you again, Congressman, and uh, very excited to chat. Great to be with you, and uh, I know this is the last uh, session before a little break, so thanks for letting me get in. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I want to get started right away. Uh, obviously, last week we saw the House vote overwhelmingly in favor of the Fit 21 bill. Um, how do we get here? How did uh, this bill that you know was introduced, I think a year and a half ago now, uh, how'd you get to a point where you're able to get it through the House with 279 votes but from Democrats and Republicans? Well, look, uh, two thirds of the House voting for the bill is extraordinary when it's simple policy. And when it's innovative and new policy, it's even harder. Um, but we got here because of solid policy, number one, real innovation and relationships. So let me explain. We listened to all the critiques of the existing marketplace in crypto. We listened to the critique of policymakers that wanted to improve the marketplace on both parties, both sides of the house, uh, both sides of the chamber. Um, and we built our policy set around the conditions that people saw for themselves. And we try to answer those key questions. That's number one, the policy. Um, then we have real innovation, real builders doing real things using real technology. The real technology has been there, but it has to be evidence to policymakers that there's real innovation and we're now seeing it in a major way. Uh, third, relationships, both with policymakers like me, with Congressman French Hill, uh, Congressman Glenn Thompson, Congressman uh, Dusty Johnson, as well as Democrats like um, Wiley Nickel uh, in uh, my native state of North Carolina, uh, as well as Jim Hine, uh, Brittany Pedersen from Colorado, uh, and Josh Gottheimer, a number of other Democrats that deeply engaged on the policy set. So then outside relationships, you, the innovators, the builders, the technologists decided that Washington was important and you started developing relationships, real relationships with policymakers and explaining the real innovation and the policy to policymakers. That's what made the difference. And those relationships put nice pressure on policymakers to go perform and we saw performance in a major way, which gives us great opportunity to make law this year. Gotcha. So, you know, I think the big question now for many of us is where does this bill go from here? You know, you've, have you built the relationships on the Senate side to try and, you know, maybe get to a vote or at least committee markup? Well, that's where the next set of uh, operations move to. Uh, look, the White House uh, not issuing a veto threat on Fit 21 was helpful and good. And it shows that they uh, they want to be at the table in making policy here. Um, the Senate is a more complicated beast. It always is. Um, 
but we need to do all that we can to reach out to senators and make sure that they prioritize this in this election year and getting things through the Senate. Uh, and if we can get two thirds of the House to vote for this bill, they should be able to get two thirds of the Senate to vote for this bill or something very similar. So, um, you know, one thing that Michael and I were talking about just a few minutes ago is, you know, there's this common perception that legislation, any kind of crypto legislation really, would have difficulty getting through the House and or Senate uh, at any point, and certainly not with the speed that we saw over the last few weeks. And I was just wondering if you could speak to, you know, have we misinterpreted Congress's approach? Um, you know, is this, is it that this is an election year that we're seeing so many lawmakers from both parties vote for crypto bills like the SAB 121 repeal and the uh, 521 Act? Or is it that this is the first time that, or rather, is there any validity to the idea that this is the first time these bills have even come up for a vote in the House and Senate? It's a new, it's a new policy. Uh, we have, uh, we've heard from the outside world and in the news media that there are crypto voters. And I think it's clear there are crypto voters. And they can go to the left or they can go to the right uh, for the candidates, but they primarily want to know whether or not you're innovation forward and you're for crypto. Um, and, uh, and I think that's helped soften up policymaking. The other thing that's of interest is that the fight from some in Washington is about the last financial crisis. And they've tried to make everything that deals with financial policy into bank policy. And especially too big to fail policy or post-financial crisis policy. Crypto is not. Crypto is not traditional finance. And it does not, uh, it does not, um, I don't think it's still constrained by the old politics of uh, the last financial crisis. This is a whole new thing. It's innovation policy, and it's the, the, the next foundation of, of technology, uh, the internet, and we wanna be at the forefront of this, not behind the rest of the world. So I think that factor is big as well, that this is not financial, uh, these aren't financial products per se, it's technology, and we need to have a regulated means of using this technology, developing this technology in the United States, and not falling behind Europe and the rest of the world. Gotcha. Right. So, I'm not sure if you heard the applause that just broke out in the audience, but there, there was applause just there. Um, so I wanna play a really quick clip. We spoke a year ago about the possibilities of a crypto bill getting through Congress, and you know, I asked if you expected something to be signed within 12 months, and uh, I th hopefully we have the clip, but here's what you said. Yes. Um, now, the, the odds of anything happening in Congress are low. So it's, a it's always a challenge to legislate something new into existence and to legislate complicated policy. So obviously, I think we saw some of those challenges play out, you know, especially in October last year. But I was hoping maybe you could just speak a little bit to, you know, what the challenges that you specifically encountered were and, you know, basically what happened uh, kind of bypass those or deal with those and address those this year. <laughs> well, look, when we talked last uh, on this, in this format, I didn't think that I was gonna end up being uh, Speaker Pro Tem, that would have uh, a Speaker of the House uh, thrown out for only having legislative successes. I didn't think my party would be that stupid to do that, uh, but that happened. And I ended up serving as Speaker Pro Tem for 23 days last October. Uh, that scrambled the legislative playbook. Um, and I designed my agenda in committee around what I thought the legislative framework would be, what the legislative opportunity would be. And so a lot happened that was unforeseen uh, when we last talked, that put us behind. And actually put us behind in this policy, bringing crypto to the floor, bringing FIT21 to the floor uh, by probably five, six months. But in those five or six months, relationships built, innovation occurred and policy sharpened and all of that helped to build a bigger vote uh, for FIT21 in the House. 
So some of those delays were political and the calendar, uh, the legislative calendar. Um, but we got it, the advantage we got out of that is a bigger vote in the House, uh, which will give us an opportunity. And we live to fight another day and get something out of the Senate. And if we get something out of the Senate, I think we'll get something signed by this president. Uh, and if not this president, the next president. So speaking of getting something signed, um, you know, for a while it seemed like stablecoin legislation might be the uh, most likely candidate for becoming a, a law in the near future. And I'm just curious, you know, what your expectations are now? What work is going on? Uh, do you still um, do you think stablecoin legislation might be uh, a law anytime in the near future, either you know, next let's say next couple of years? Uh, and what work has to go into that? Well, look. At this stage, right now, we will have crypto law within the next year. Uh, and I can say that with certainty. Um, if it doesn't happen now, between now and the election, I think what we passed out of the House will make its way into law in, in a very similar form um, under the next Congress. I, I really think that happened. Uh, same thing for stablecoin legislation. I think we're so close on this. We just need a legislative calendar so that we can get things across the finish line of the Senate. And um, and that means we have to have uh, the time allocated to do it. So I think at this stage of the game, crypto policy is inevitable. Um, and crypto law is inevitable. And we will start catching up with Europe, Singapore, Hong Kong, and Japan and having some market certainty and pro-innovation policy. So earlier today, we had a majority whip Tom Emmer on stage, on the stage, and he suggested that the lame duck session might be uh, a time or the opportunity for you know, attaching something to a must-pass bill. Are you looking at any of the you know, pieces of legislation that are likely to move in that time period as maybe the vehicle to uh, have some crypto legislation make its way? Anything and everything, uh, and that, that's what I'm looking for. Look, we, we basically have a consensus product out of the House of Representatives. Um, that gives us a fighting chance in every legislative product that makes its way uh, to the president's desk. I think that's a huge thing that we've got to take advantage of and leverage it into law uh, and use every opportunity we have to get a good deal. So um, kind of just looking at the broader swaths of the crypto world, are there any other issues in crypto specifically that you're looking at as areas where um, you know, maybe it could benefit from legislation either addressing the regulators, the different markets? Um, and you know, so how are you looking at these? Well, look, I'm, I'm not going to go negotiate against myself. We've got a, we've got a bill out of the House of Representatives, and it got uh, almost every Republican, um, and it got uh, a, a third of the Democrats. And in this political environment, for us to do that is massive, massive, and almost unheard of when it comes to policy coming out of the Ag Committee or out of the Financial Services Committee in the House. So I, I think that's the big thing, and it's the main thing, and we're going to stay focused on the main thing. Uh, if we get market structure done, that is a win, and then we can go refi further refine what these regulators should and should not be doing. Uh, but if we get this market structure bill passed, uh, that will be that will put us uh, at the forefront of uh, digital asset policy for the globe. That's where we that, that's where we deserve to be. That's where we should be. And that's where I'm fighting for us to be. So, um, you know, kind of speaking to, you know, more. Your personal uh, future. You know, you announced uh, your retirement at the end of this term. You have seven months. I'm really curious. You know, are there any particular goals, any piece of legislation besides crypto, or in addition to what you've already gotten through the house, that you are just looking to accomplish? Uh, you know, in a in that time. Uh, I've got my three major priorities for the Financial Services Committee, uh, and that is uh, the market structure bill. Under digital, for digital assets, um, number one. Number two, data privacy for the financial services realm. We got to make sure that we have the best technology uh, protecting our financial data. 
Uh, and third and finally, capital formation, helping link up uh, investors with new investment opportunities for small businesses to find new uh, sources of capital uh, and to make the system easier uh, for, for folks to get their ideas connected with capital. And so those are my major priorities, the capital formation, data privacy, and digital assets. And um, I'll take getting any one of those signed into law uh, this, this year. Awesome. Well, I know you have uh, to jump, but I really appreciate your joining us and good luck with the rest of your term. Well, thank you, Nick. And uh, thank you all for your engagement. Without, without the crypto community, without the digital asset world and activists, uh, without every tweet, without every phone call you've made, without every email, uh, we would not have had this big vote in the house. So keep innovating, uh, keep driving, keep, keep creating, um, and that will help bring us victory and uh, clarity under law. So thanks so much for your engagement and uh, thank you for your friendship. God bless. Thank you, Congressman McHenry. And uh, again, I hope you heard the applause that just broke out here. Thank you everyone for joining us on day one of Consensus. Uh, it's been a packed day. We have two more to go. Um, tomorrow we're gonna to be hearing from BlackRock and Fidelity about ETFs. We're gonna be hearing about political strategy in crypto at you know the current moment in time. Uh, we'll be talking about policy issues over on the Money Reimagined stage on the far end over there. And of course, Michael Casey will be interviewing presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. here tomorrow. So. Hope to see you bright-eyed and bushy-tailed at whatever we open, actually. I don't know what time that is. Thanks for sticking around. Have a good one.